are here in this universe, in this world, is there some special purpose in being born human? Or is it merely an accident in creation that certain living beings are born human and they live in a certain style, make decisions, go through the process of life and then die? Human beings from their birth till their death are constantly faced with the dilemma of trying to determine if their life on this planet and in this creation is in their hands or in the hands of somebody else. This question is asked all the time. Do I have real free will or am I in the hands of another power who has predetermined every step that I can take? This is an important question because if our life is predetermined, and we have no free will, we are not responsible for what is going on here. We are not even responsible for our own life. And what happens must be the responsibility of someone else who wrote the script through which we are going. And if we have real free will and we make the decisions that lead to our destiny, when we are writing out our script as we go along, in which case the question becomes even more important, what is the purpose of giving us these choices, this free will in human life? Are we heading for some particular goal, going in some direction, trying to reach a destination? What is all this going on? This is a legitimate question. People have been bothered by this question everywhere at all times. How much of our life is predetermined and how much is in our own hands? Is a human being the maker of his or her own destiny or are the gods responsible, are the stars responsible for what is happening to us? In the early 60s, when I first came to this country, I found a lot of people interested in knowing the purpose of life, in understanding the Eastern views, the Oriental views on what is the purpose of human life, in understanding if any explanations have been offered by people who have experimented with consciousness, with the very source of life, with the very basis of experience. And I was very deeply impressed by the Western approach to an Eastern subject, the Western scientific exploration of the mystique of Eastern mysticism. That proved to be a great challenge for me. I said, this is the greatest opportunity. Here for thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years, 12,000 years, we do not know how old the written, published works called the four Vedas, how old they are, we don't know, but they refer to this very subject. We are dealing with the same subject. Max Muller only recently in Germany translated those words and considered them contemporaneously important. Today, psychologists, leaders in religion, spirituality are asking the same question. And here is an opportunity of meeting with people with a Western scientific mind, a mind that does not want to go by the old voodoo theories of the East, but wants to examine the real nature of consciousness, the real nature of life and its purpose, and examine it in a scientific way. I shared my thoughts with people. I lectured all over the country from coast to coast in 1962, 63. There were many people who were interested, but they numbered a few hundred people, maybe a thousand. And then later on I came and I said, I can speak of what the stars foretell. I was surrounded by tens of thousands of people. I was amazed. I thought here is a Western society that will accept only that which is scientifically proven, which can be established by experimental evidence. 
and here when I said the stars are telling this in the future, they would nod their heads and say, this man knows. It was a strange experience for me. But the question that came into my mind was, if all these people with their scientific background, rational background, believe that the stars can tell something, surely they believe that some part of our destiny is predetermined. And that became the opening sentence of one of my talks. I said, nobody sitting here is convinced that there is everything in one's own hand. Everybody sitting here believes there is a power that controls our human life, that sets into motion certain events of life which are not in human hands, which are not within the ambit of free will. For instance, most of us can look back into our lives and relate it to a previous event. Today what has happened is dependent on what happened yesterday. If yesterday were different, today would be different. What happened yesterday is dependent upon day before yesterday. And you keep going like this retroactively into your own life and you find ultimately all that happened arose out of the accident of where you were born, who was your mother, who was your father. And that was not in your control. It appears that the birth at a certain point in time and space has so much to do with all that follows. I had a friend of mine studying with me at Harvard and living in Boston. After I had left the university and I was working on a small project with the United Nations, he called me one day and he said, Ishwar, I have found out the truth. I have found out that human beings have no free will. And he came to this conclusion with a startlingly simple argument. He said, if there is a creator, a God, who is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, if he knows everything and he exists, then man cannot have free will. Because if man has free will to do what he likes, which is unknown to anybody, then God cannot be omniscient. He cannot be all-knowing. If God already knows what man will do, how can man be really free? That means man is merely a creature of God's will and is doing things consciously or unconsciously in accordance with that will. Therefore, man has no real free will. The argument was so simple. He was startled by the fact why he didn't accept it earlier, why he wasted so many years reading so many books about free will and determinism. But when this great truth dawned upon him, he was so excited. He said, Eureka or Eureka, how do you pronounce it? The, the Greeks, I think, say Eureka, but anyway, whatever way you pronounce, he shouted the great discovery and he called me and came and saw me. And he said, I took a long time, but at last I have come to the truth. Man has no free will. Everything is predetermined. If it was not predetermined, God would not be possible. The argument was simple. I asked my secretary to bring on a tray a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. I said, bring both on a tray. And I presented to my friend. And I said, my dear friend, you have found out you have no free will. Now tell me, without using free will which you don't have, will you have tea or coffee or neither? I said, remember, you have no free will. You cannot decide. And he stumbled upon this strange situation that a cup of tea and a cup of coffee can disprove the great truth that he just found. I told him, not only do you have free will at this moment, you are trapped in free will. If you say, tea or coffee or neither, there is no way for you to say either of these except to free will. You cannot escape it. You can't even run away now. You came to me to share the great new knowledge you acquired and here the knowledge is being splashed into pieces on a tray with a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. And this is just symbolic. Every day, 
we come on the crossroads and I could decide, should I turn right or left? Should I do this or that? Should I do it or not do it? Every day you have to make decisions. Every day options and alternatives come in your life. How can you say you have no free will? He was amazed at the possibility of his great proof being demolished so quickly with a simple thing like a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. So he said, I am confused, which is the usual thing that happens when we try to reason too much about truth. Have you noticed that? If you try to rationalize, to reason and find out the nature of truth through the rational, logical process, eventually you find you get more confused. If you aren't sufficiently confused, think and reason more about it. You get confused. Anybody can try. As many times as you like. If you say, no, I am very clear in my mind. Come and sit with me and we'll reason. And after a while you say, I am confused. There must be some basis for these things happening. I told my friend, you said you found out the truth. That if there is a God, and he is omniscient, and he knows everything, then he must know whether you will take tea, coffee or neither. And if he knows it in advance, you cannot do anything except what he knows. Therefore, you have no free will. And yet, when these alternatives have come before you, you feel you have free will. What is the truth? Either you become an atheist. So there can be no God if you have free will. Or you accept that God alone has the will and you have no free will. There is no third will. I said, I have just confused you because you came to this conclusion intellectually. But I must tell you, I share the truth that you came to earlier. Man has no free will if there is a God. It's not possible. And yet, man has the experience of free will. Must experience as if he or she is making choices. And that distinguishes a human being from all other beings in the universe. Only a human being has the experience of making choices between alternatives. And feeling that because one is making those choices, there must be free will. What makes for this free will? I said, what makes for free will is, you do not know what you have already chosen. The moment you know, you have no free will. Therefore, man's free will is based upon ignorance. The moment man gets knowledge, he will have no free will. So long as a human being is ignorant of what has happened tomorrow, or five minutes later, or one minute later, free will will prevail and will be an actual experience. I told him, in choosing between tea and coffee, as an example, what made you choose freely? Supposing I gave you a free choice. And you thought over it and said, okay, I'll take coffee. What made you say that? With making any choices, you are governed by two sets of factors. Maybe your father, grandfather, great-grandfather likes coffee. You got that through the genes. Hereditary factors. Or maybe you are lived amongst people, amongst friends and society who love coffee. Therefore, environmentally, you like coffee. I said, examine this possibility that all choices you make are governed either by hereditary factors of choice, hereditary preferences or environmental preferences, that there will be no third category to which you can attribute a factor of preference. And if this is so, at the moment of choice, all your hereditary factors are fixed, you cannot change your parents or the ancestry, nor can you change the environment to which you have passed up to the point when you made the decision to turn tea and coffee. Therefore, although it looks that the two alternatives through which you had to make a choice, between which you had to choose, they're real, and they were real, the fact is, the system that operated in consciousness to make a choice, that was so bound down by these two factors of choice, that there was no way for you to choose, except freely choose coffee alone. Only. Had I access to these factors of choice in your consciousness, in your brain, and fed it into a computer, the computer
Peter would have whispered in his ear, before you could make a free will choice, he is going to choose free will, true free will, freely, only possible. What is your free will then? If even so-called free will can lead only to one conclusion, there is a free will. Free will does not lie in the fact that you can really choose one or the other. Free will of a human being lies in the fact, I have a choice, I can make a choice and go through the conscious processes of choosing that free will. It's a process of going through the selection that is called free will, not the actual choice. Because the actual choice can be predicted. And it's predetermined. Now understand, the real nature of free will, the real nature of free will is that the choices are all predetermined. But when we go through the process of meeting different alternatives that lead to those choices in human life, at every step we feel we are making those choices. And this experience of being able to make choices is called free will and is the most important asset that human beings have in the whole civilization. It makes a human being the top of creation. It makes human beings made in the likeness of the creator himself. Because in this game there is nobody else who has free will except the creator, God, who has real free will because he laid down the whole show, including where we will be born, and a human being who feels he can make the choice. There is nobody else, no third. Who has ever had that experience? Therefore, a human being alone is made in the image of the Father, in the image of God, in the image of the Creator. And what makes it so similar to the Creator is not the bodily function, not the physical form, but this unique feature in human consciousness of experiencing choice between alternatives in the nature of free will. And the same real free will because of knowledge existing in the Creator's God himself. That makes us so close to each other. What happens then? What is the significance of this free will in human life? The significance is a free will, the experience of free will, I might even say the illusion of free will. Because it is not real, but looks real, we might call it the illusion of free will. The illusion of free will in human life makes us Speaker of truth. Consider if this was not there, we could never be speaker of truth. Nobody could tell us, speak and we shall find. Because there was no way to speak. The only way we can speak is when we have the alternative to take this or that. Therefore, speaking is made possible only by the experience of free will. And the experience of free will makes a man, makes a human being feel. He really makes his or her testimony. And this is the important thing, that when you seek, you can find. Seeking is dependent upon this unique feature in human life. But how will you seek? What makes one seek? We see billions of people on this, billions of human beings. And we see trillions and decillions of other forms of life upon this earth. And they are all growing and passing time. Going through phases of experience, being fed, eating, drinking, growing, growing old, dying. This is happening throughout the whole creation. This is so universal a rule. This metabolical principle, this change that is taking place from one cell to a larger number of cells, the growth of a living organism, its functioning in life, and then growing and dying. It's so common. It's been going on for billions of years. We can see it going on all the time, whether they're trees and plants, they're animals, birds, insects, human beings. And if some people have astral consciousness and they can project into the astral world, they will say, astral angels, gods, astral beings, disembodied souls, they are all going through the same process. And there are millions and billions of these things moving around as a living organism as if they are programmed. They are programmed to grow, multiply, become big, feed themselves, lead to certain instinctive desires, meet those desires, grow bigger, die. This seems to be a normal cycle. Except 
for one unusual thing happening in the whole drama and that is the human being speaking the purpose of the drama. Nobody has seen the purpose. The human being speaking the truth. The human being speaking to find out where do I belong? Do I belong to this place? Therefore, the human being in the human body becomes different from all others. I recently read a very interesting study purely on the physical level. It examines the trace elements in the human body and examines the trace elements in all other animals. Every kind of living organism from plants, insects, birds, reptiles, mammals, all animals were examined and they found that the trace elements found in the physical body of all these living creatures bore the same proportion as the proportion of those trace elements in the earth, thereby showing they are made out of earth and when they die they go back into earth. Their combination is exactly the same. But the human being was totally different. The trace elements in the human being did not correspond with the proportion of those trace elements in the rest of the earth, whether in the crust or in the whole of the earth. It was a unique thing. It was also found that the retina of the human eye was differently designed than the retina of all other things. And the colors that can be seen through rods and cones of the retina and the optic nerve extension of the human eye is not duplicated even by the nearest neighbor of the monkeys and the gorilla. It was a very startling thing. And just trying to examine one, one interesting question somebody put when this was presented, this paper was presented was, does it mean that the human beings don't really belong to the earth? That we are survivors of a race from some other planet, which when that planet was destroyed or came to an end, we decided to come over here and inhabit this planet? Is it possible? Even those questions are being asked. Are we all astronauts? Now landed upon another satellite? Or are we really belonging to the earth from the beginning? I am not referring to that as a subject of in-depth study right now because what we are now examining is that the human being in the human body is so distinct, so different from all other living creatures. And the greatest difference continues to be in the experience of free will in the experience of people, in the experience of trying to find. That's not there anywhere else. If the human beings lived only instinctively, supposing human beings lived by instinct, they would have no seeking either. They would be running like a computerized machine like all other living beings are running. They would be just programmed to go through certain motions depending upon their desires, depending upon the hunger and appetite built into the system, you just grow up and die without any seeking. The fact that human beings seek distinguishes them from all of them. Now this is the same situation that here are so many human beings upon this earth and how many of them seek? Theoretically everyone should seek because everyone has free will. But when we go around meeting all the human beings, we find so many of them are still living an animal life. So many are living the life of a bird. It looks like they like some other forms of life and they continue to live instinctively, almost mechanically, other life. They say they are so busy, they have no time for anything else except just to survive. And the survival instinct overcomes everything else. How come all of them don't speak? What makes some people speak and some don't speak? The choice is available to everyone. Why doesn't everyone see? You go out to a city and meet people, holler for them. How many of your people? They say, we're a crazy guy. Let's go and do our job. We have to make our money. We have to go and get our paycheck. We have to go and earn enough. Busy in the same thing that a bird is going to do to pick up the little food for the nest. They're doing the same thing. How come a large number of them don't even want to see? What is preventing some people from speaking and what is enabling some people from speaking? There must be something around us which 
make draw some people to speak, but does not seem to draw other people to speak. What is that something? Now you will see a very strange phenomena in human life upon this earth, and if there is life elsewhere, we can investigate upon life anywhere else. And that is, human beings are always accosted by two kind of languages that they have to read or listen to. Two languages. One is a language of their own mind. It is spoken and written and communicated in speech and writing. It need not be English or American or French or German or Sanskrit. Any language of the world is a language of the mind because it must be expressed in a form that needs time and space to communicate. What are languages? Spoken and written languages. All spoken and written languages of the world are phonetic expressions put down into character symbolization. When they are phonetic expressions, the phonetic sound makes the sense depending upon the association of ideas of the phonetic sound with the experience in life. If I see a table and I hear the word, the sound table, I begin to associate the word table with this experience of seeing something that looks like this. If I see more tables, the meaning of the sound called table gets enlarged to cover all the tables. Ultimately, it will become definitive if I cover thousands of tables and I still consider them as tables. The sound of table does not have any other significance except in relation to the association of ideas I have with that phonetic symbol with an actual physical experience. Such a language which subsists on these phonetic symbols cannot subsist except in time, space, and follow the laws of cause and effect. There is no other way. If we have a language in which each word, when spoken, is related to the meaning of that word by association of actual experience through sense perceptions, it must be bound down by that limitation. Same thing is true about the written word. The written word is merely a character symbolic of the spoken word. And therefore, the spoken word carries its limitations into the written word also. All the languages of the world, when they are spoken or written, suffer from this strange constraint, limitation, that they can only occur in a kind of life that is based upon time, space, and causation. And therefore, they can only be spoken by the human mind. Because the human mind cannot function except within time, space, and causes. Emmanuel Kant was the first who made a great examination of this and discovered that there is no way for a human mind to function except through a framework of time, space, and causation. Time, space, cause, effect relationship. You have to put these together to make the human mind function. He went so far as to say, there is no such thing as a human mind. When experience is loaded into a frame of time, space and cause and effect, that's called the mental experience. He went that far. But the truth is, the mind, whether it functions as a receiver of sense perception and therefore a meaning to sense perception, which is called the interpretative function of the mind, or it is the middle portion of the mind which does reasoning, logic, thinking, or it is the higher form of the mind which gives us the inspirational new ideas. Any one of these, you examine the nature of mind, you will find it functions only in time, space, and cause and effect. It cannot function out. What about other things that happen to us in consciousness? What about intuition? What about love? What about the sudden aesthetic? experience of beauty. Where do they figure? They don't come into this category at all. Therefore, there is some possibility in human consciousness to have experience that transcends the mental experience. And yet it is human. It is still conscious experience. It is still experience in this world. Where does it come from? It's not from the mind. 
There is something else in consciousness that is reading a language that is not based upon connotation of association of ideas, that is not based upon the phonetic and structural symbols. It is based upon something else it reads around it. What is the second language? It has been very difficult to give a strict name to the second language which affects us so deeply. But I will try and give one word to describe a second language that transcends the spoken and written language. That is called the language of coincidence. Ever heard of that? Coincidence and circumstance. Certain coincidences and circumstances happen in life and we are hit by them. There is no explanation. There is nothing to do with time space connotation. It startles us and we say this means more than what we see. Where does it come from? Circumstance and coincidence. Who is creating that? I had a very strange experience of finding a group of people who are seekers as distinct from non seekers. The non seeker told me coincidence is a very rare thing. We never experienced it. Then I came to the seeker, they said, We have got a strange coincidence. Then I found very deep seekers, earnest seekers. They had more coincidences than anyone else. What is this going on? This coincidence is merely the synchronicity of certain happenings which seem to sharply give rise to a new connotation, not based upon language or symbol. If synchronicity of happening can give rise to a new meaning, how come when you are a seeker, you have more of these synchronicities than if you are not? What is the relationship between speaking the truth and coincidence? Make a study. You will be as startled as I am. I am startled everywhere I find. I have lectured in this country at so many places and I am startled by finding the number of people. The more keen they are to speak the truth, the more their life is transformed in the number of coincidences happening in their life. What language is that? Where does it come from? What is the language of coincidence? Then I found another startling thing, even more startling than this, that every time a person had an intuitive hunch, intuitively felt something which was not consistent with the reasoning in his head, which was not logical, which was not acceptable to thought, which was not acceptable to the rational man enough. When such a strange hunch came, that gut knowledge came, that feeling came, with no explanation, simultaneously or within one week thereof, the strange coincidence happened outside an environmental accident which confirmed what happened earlier as a hunch in the human consciousness. What is this relationship? What is the nature of intuition? When we say a pure intuitive feeling, a pure intuitive knowledge comes to us without thought, without time, without space, without cause, when that sudden hunch comes, flash of knowledge with no explanation, we cannot say where it came from. We cannot explain it. Yet it is there, we feel it, we know it. Have you never had that feeling? I know this, I don't know why, how, but I know it. Where does it come from? And when that feeling comes, that knowing comes, that knowledge comes, and it is accompanied by a coincidence outside, corroborating that knowledge. What does it mean? Surely there is a second language which cannot be put down in the symbols of phonetic sound or in the symbols of structured letters of an alphabet. Therefore, there is a certain language which circumstances around us are playing. There is a certain language with the intuitive hunch inside the soul of a human being is expressing. They seem to go together and are not spoken of it. This unspoken and unwritten language which pervades, you will find that is the language that distinguishes the speaker from the mountain. You will find when somebody has thought the truth, somebody has thought more than mere survival, somebody has thought more than the mere maintenance of the human machine, it has come by an experience related to a speaking intuitively or a speaking created by coincidence. Look back into it. This is so significant that when we look at our own lives 
and we find that this seeking is coming from something within and something outside, we begin to see there must be some conscious power beyond what we thought was our own mental power. When does this call come to us? When do these coincidences come to us? And when do we become seekers? If there was a cause and effect relationship, we could say, when we seek, then the call comes to us and circumstances become like that. If we believed in cause and effect relationship, we would say, when circumstances are right, we begin to seek. The truth is, none follows or precedes the other. They both come at the same time. In each and every case of a true spiritual seeking that I have found, the internal feeling to look for something real, to look for the truth, and the external circumstance which gave a call for that took place at the same time. Look back into your own life. Look back into the events of life. And see if these two things did not match. If they matched, where did the call come from? If we look at the organized way this synchronicity takes place, defying the laws of probability. If we look at the organized way this call comes to fit in with something that no one else knows except our own inward soul. When we look at these organized, regulated, perfect synchronicity between these two, we are left with no option but to believe there is a power higher than what we think is our own mental power. This governs things to which our mind does not have access. You can call that power God. You can call that power creator. You can call that power nature. You can call that power higher soul. You can call that power the perfect consciousness of a human being. Doesn't matter what you call it. But the existence of such a power that overrides the mental decision making we are doing becomes obvious when we go through this process and look at what is happening to people who are seeking. The existence of an overriding power that gives rise to circumstances and coincidences which correlate with our own intuitive feeling gives us evidence of there being some power higher than unknown to us, unknown to the mind, higher than the mind, somewhere controlling human destiny in a way the mind cannot easily understand. That being the situation, then it is that power percolating everywhere. If we recognize that power, we are legitimately entitled to call it God. Because then that fits in well with the definition of there being a God who is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. But such a power pervades everything. It pervades even our thoughts. It pervades even our choice making. It pervades every aspect of our life. If we call that power overriding power, that overrides our mental decision making as God, then we might say God calls us at the same time when we have a feeling of seeking. It does not mean that God calls us and then we seek. It does not mean we seek and God calls us. It means when we have the experience of seeking, that is God calling us. When God is calling us, at that very moment, we are experiencing seeking. We are at the, the same thing. You will notice it's the same thing. You will not seek unless God calls. And God does not call unless you experience seeking. Therefore, it is the seeking which is the best evidence whether God is calling us or not. Now look at our own life and we find many are called. But few are chosen. What does that mean? Many are called. The seeking comes to many. But few are chosen. Tomorrow in the workshop, we'll go into the second aspect more deeply. Why are few chosen? What is the meaning of being chosen? What if chosen means attaining that which you seek? If chosen means realizing the purpose of life, Finding out the objective before us, finding the destination, going back to God's home, considering God as our creator, going back to the creator's home, considering that we are part of the creator or one with the creator, going back to our own real home. If that is what is the meaning of being chosen, 
Why are very few chosen? So many are called, so many have become seekers. Why are very few chosen? Why are very few reaching the tent? What is coming in the womb? It's a good question because one can then look at the human being who is seeking and then something stands in his way from being chosen. This is the question we are addressing ourselves in this lecture and in the workshop tomorrow. Many are seeking. Few are realizing what they are seeking. What is coming in the way that makes the many into the few? What is coming in the way that all of us who are the many seekers cannot find what we are seeking? But you will see the answer can come very easily if you look at the functioning of the same process in human consciousness which we call the mind, the thinking rational process, the logical process. When you see how the logical process functions in the human mind, you will find that is the process responsible for making the many into the few. That is the process that ties us down into the language of the mind, whereas the seeking came from the language of the soul, the language of the universe, the language of circumstance. When we put the language of circumstances and coincidences, when we put the language of intuition, into a tight frame of the logical sequence, we do not proceed with the seeking. The reason is simple. The seeking we are having is not logical. It doesn't make sense in the logical sense. Therefore, when we want to seek, the seeking comes because many are called. When the seeking comes, what do we seek with? We bring the mind back to seek and we get betrayed by the mind. We get stuck here. We get a roadblock of our own creation by, by our own mind. Who is to blame for this? No one. It's a system. We have to see the system. How come this human mind, which is so useful, which is such a wonderful computer. Did you know the best computer is the human mind, the brain sitting out here? I once went way back to the NASA lab. And the director was explaining to me at that time, early, in one of those early experiments, when they were still sending very small safe shackles out. At that time, he explained to me in one small size room about, about this corner of this auditorium. There's a big set of machines with connections and wires, and he said, this is the largest computer in the world. It can hold 10 million bytes of information and can process all of them and give you any result in any combination using all those 10 million types. I said, wow. I'm not in that form, I hadn't learned to say that well that time. <laughs> but in an Indian expression, I expressed my amazement at the machine sitting in a small corner could hold so much memory. And I said, you technologists and scientists have done a good job. And the director said, not too good a job because the little machine you are carrying with you on your head here, enclosed in the skull, according to our present known information, is containing the same kind of equipment which can hold memory spaces and can hold 20 billion bytes of information. Not million, billion bytes of information. It's fitting into such a small skull like the human head. And this mind and brain we talk about is no more than a computer. Have you ever studied it? How does it function? It gets its power from consciousness. You make it unconscious, it can do nothing. You give it life and consciousness, and it begins to perform functions. All the functions that the mind performs are based upon the input and output and the programming. Nothing else. I have not come across a single mind anywhere in the world which could function beyond the functioning of a computer. If you know any mind, tell me. I want to look for a mind that can function beyond a computer. It's a good computer. It's a big one. It's got a large capacity. It has got a lot of memory space. It is very little used. Only a very small fraction of the brain is being used by us. There is something in us, consciousness per se, which gives power to this computer, which has a function this computer cannot perform. There is a consciousness in us 
which can do things the computer cannot do. For example, the computer cannot love, but consciousness, the human being can love. Love in the sense of identifying with another. Here is a human being who experiences love in the process of love, forgets himself or herself and identifies with the one whom one is loving. Becomes that one. The computer cannot do it. The mind cannot do it. The thinking machine, which is the mind, can never do it. Have you ever met anybody in this world, anywhere, amongst any of your friends, in any place, in any city, in any country, who could claim that by thinking hard, he could experience love? I have not met anyone. Not even one person. But I have met hundreds of people who had the unique, strange, sudden experience of love for somebody. And the more they thought about it, the more the love disappeared. Went away from it. How can a computer promote love? The computer can give you the mechanics. This brain, this mind, this thinking machine can do no more than mechanize everything. It's a mechanical device. Just because the creator put it into a human system, made it part of the physical body, put it into the brain, into the head, does not mean it is more than a mere computer. It is a computer. And all these so-called mental functions of reasoning, thinking, logical perception, using certain forms of logic, all the syllogism that is going into this head is a pure computer function. The more you study the functioning of the mind, the more you are convinced it is nothing more than a good computer. Maybe the best known so far. I am not even sure of that. Sometimes I feel we may end up with computers that are better than ours and they may try to take over this mind. But there is something else. For want of any other word, we in the East gave it a different name. We called it the soul. We said the human soul, the spirit of consciousness, is not the mind. The mind is added on to be used. The mind is a machine given to consciousness to use. If consciousness realizes, if consciousness per se, awareness of being here, just the beingness of here, being here realizes we have a machine called the mind, the brain, we have to use it, we have to make excellent use of it. Nobody can be unhappy. How can a computer make us unhappy? We have to use it. But if we become the computer, and the computer decides who we are, we become unhappy. Then we are programmed. Look at people who are happy and unhappy in this world. You find they fall into a distinct class. Those who believe they are the mind, they are unhappy. Those who believe they have a mind they can use are happy. The distinction is so simple. Those who associate themselves with the spirit of consciousness, having the ability to think, to use thinking as they like, are happy. And those who say, they are the thought, they are unhappy. In the workshop tomorrow, we will go through, those of you who are attending, how many of you are attending, please raise your hand. Good, thank you. Those of you who are attending, will have an experience of watching the mind functioning as an independent computer. And yet, Human beings as consciousness still us witnessing that functioning of the computer. If we can witness the functioning of the mind as a computer, we are obviously separate from the computer. We are not the mind. We are not the computer. We are consciousness per se. The being that is aware that can make use of the mind. Now when the mind becomes us, we are in trouble. Because then the mind leads us wherever it likes then we become subject to the laws of cause and effect of the program in the mind. We cannot get out of it. All the conditioning that has taken place upon the mind from birth till now makes us the slaves of that condition. How can we have free will? How can we have any happiness? What can we have? How do we have anything? If we are merely the creatures and products of the conditioning of the mind from birth till now, and if we can regress into a life of the mind beyond birth, that means earlier than birth, if we can find that mind had a life and had experiences, had thoughts even before we were born in some other form, if we are reincarnation, if the soul is transmigrating from body to body, and the mind is bringing all that, we are so firmly conditioned, no way to get out of it. 
therefore identifying ourselves with the mind is the greatest obstacle to realizing who we are and what is the purpose of life and why we are here. The conditioning of the mind, the way the mind has been conditioned by previous exposure to experience, that is the only bottleneck, the only blockade that does not let the seeker, who is one of the many called, become the chosen one who are few. There is nothing else standing in the way. When we rely so heavily upon our thinking mind, the seeking in us does not reach its objective, does not get satisfied. When we release ourselves from the mind, from the thinking process, and rely upon the other things, Consciousness per se has things like love, beauty, intuition, sudden knowing. When we rely upon that, when we can look around and read the language of coincidence and circumstance, which the mind cannot read, then we are freed from that, we can become the chosen one, we can reach our destination. Therefore, it is true, just by being human, just by being equipped, with the illusion, with the actual experience of choosing between alternatives, just by having the experience of free will, we have been called and we are amongst the many who are called. And if we rely only on the mind, the same process, the same machine, the same computer, to cope up with our seeking, we fall on the wayside. We do not go on and only leave a few to be chosen. Therefore, the seeking this is natural to us being human. The choosing of the few, the being chosen of the few, is dependent upon our escape from the conditioning of the mind, our escape from the tentacles of the mind, which hold us down. And we can free ourselves from the tentacles of time, space, conditioning, causation, cause, effect, thinking, reasoning, then we can release ourselves from this. Use these as equipment given to us and be separate from it we become the few that are chosen. Thank you very much.